Amazing. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining for the last day of Rusty Days. We're going to chat for the next 30 minutes or so about observability. In particular, we're going to discuss if the Rust ecosystem at this point in time provides enough tooling to write observable APIs. And we're going to go through the journey of writing one and see how that came along. My name is Luca Palmieri. I work as a lead engineer at TrueLayer. We're going to spend some words about that in a second. In the Rust ecosystem, I contribute to the Rust London user group, where I curate uh, the Code Dojo. I've been contributor and maintainer of a variety of crates in the open source ecosystem, Limfa, Wiremark, and some others. And I'm currently writing Zero to Production, which is a book on Rust backend development, which I publish chapter by chapter on my blog, which you can see linked uh, down there. So uh, let's get to the meat of what we're going to discuss tonight. This is a little bit our agenda. So we're going to see what Donate Direct is. Uh, Donate Direct is an application and it's going to drive our whole journey. We're going to see what it entailed to bring that application to production. And then we're going to zoom in on three types of telemetry data, which are often collected to observe the behavior of applications in production environments. Metrics, logging, and distributed traces. If you don't know what they are, or you haven't experienced working with them before, that's not a problem. We're going to give all the details, and I'll walk you through uh, why they're useful and how we collect them. So let's start from the very basics. What is Donate Direct? Uh, before that, let's get two words on what Trulayer does, which is going to frame the conversation. Now, Trulayer is a company which operates in the financial technology space. In particular, we provide APIs uh, for people to consume. We mainly provide two types of APIs, uh, one for accessing banking data on behalf of a user, and then one to initiate a banking transfer, once again, on behalf of a user. So you pay using your own bank account, without credit cards, without intermediaries of other type. During the COVID pandemic, as many other people, we kind of tried to think what we could do in any way to help relieve pressure or contribute to what was happening. Uh, so myself, with a group of other colleagues, put together an application called Donate Direct, which lets you use our payment initiation technology to donate money to charities. Uh, so as you can see in the GIF on the left, the flow is very simple. So you select a charity from a list, you specify how much amount uh, you want to donate, uh, then you fill in some tax stuff, and you get redirected to the flow of your bank. And the money goes through your bank account to the charity without any fee. So today you did this completely free of charge, matching some donations. Now, as it happens when you do side projects of different kinds, so things that are a little bit outside the main product line, you have a chance to experiment with technologies which would be considered a little bit too edgy uh, to be used in the core product. And as you might imagine, considering that this is a Rust talk in a Rust conference, uh, the Net Direct backend API is built in Rust. Uh, now, it's not our first uh, round with Rust, but it was our first Rust API in production here through layer. It was the first time we were actually shipping code that was responding interactively uh, to users uh, coming from the wild web. So I want to see lots of emojis when I rewatch the stream at this specific slide. Now, as I said, we experimented with it before. So we were doing build tooling, we were doing CLIs, we were doing some weird Kubernetes controllers um, for non-critical stuff, and so on and so forth. But once you actually put an API in front of a user, then the bar of how that API needs to be raised significantly. Which brings us to our journey to production. Now, to use the words from someone that's wiser than myself, one does not simply work into production for a variety of reasons. And reason number one is that, generally speaking, production environments are very complex. So if we look at this diagram, this depicts uh, Monzo's uh, production environment. So each of the blue dots is a microservice in Monzo's cluster. And each of the lines connecting two dots are microservices talking to each other over the network. Now, we, the layer is not Monzo, so it doesn't have 1,600 microservices interacting in production. But you might imagine that our production environment is equally complex in many subtle ways. 
And what generally you try to plan for in a production environment is not even really the APKs. So is stuff actually working? But you try to predict or to mitigate the way stuff can fail. So what happens if one of those blue dots, uh, for example, in the Monzo cluster goes down? What happens if one of those blue dots start responding more slowly than it generally does or is supposed to do, or it doesn't elastically uh, react to searching traffic? All these kind of behaviors in a very connected graph like that can cause cascading failures. And it becomes very, very difficult once something like that is happening to troubleshoot why and fix it if possible. Now, what does each of those blue dots actually is? Uh, now, in two layers case, uh, we run a Kubernetes cluster. So all our production applications are deployed on top of Kubernetes, which means those blue dots are Kubernetes deployment. Kubernetes deployment is just uh, a service definition, uh, which is going to orchestrate a bunch of copies of the application. Each of those copies is called a pod, and the pod may be composed on one or more Docker containers. Uh, the pods are identical to one another, and so they can be dynamically scaled to match uh, traffic increasing, and they can also be on different machines in order to give us redundancy if one of those machines uh, ends up going down for whatever reason. Now, what does it mean to release something to production? Here at TrueLayer, um, especially when you look at things from an operational perspective, you want to have a certain set of guarantees about what each of those applications uh, provides from an operational point of view. What this means is you want to be sure that the set of best practices uh, is being followed consistently. All those best practices are collected in a huge uh, checklist called the pre-production checklist. Now, if you are an on-call engineer, uh, the pre-production checklist is in many ways uh, a very nice thing in the sense that it gives you a baseline uh, level of quality, especially on the observability side, as we're going to see. And you can be sure that those metrics and those logs are going to be there. Now, if you're a developer who's trying to deploy a new application, the pre-production checklist can be a significant hurdle, because there are a lot of things that you need to do in order to actually see your application out there. And so keeping along with the Lord of the Rings metaphor, they might look a little bit like the Ghost of the Rings, and they look quite scary at this point in time. This is like the first movie. So what's the dilemma? Uh, on the left, application developer, or in general, like you're building something that looks really cool, you want to ship it. And when you are at the beginning of your startup journey, so when you are a skanky group uh, doing a skanky app that is only built by a bunch of people, we implicitly know that what you're doing is particularly risky because a new product is a new company, uh, you just iterate in fast, it's fine to just ship it. You put your cowboy hat on and you just deploy to production. Now, as you mature along your journey, you start to get bigger and bigger customers. And those customers will have enterprise expectations. So they want your service to be up. You will have SLAs with them. And in general, just your reputation uh, will demand of you higher level of reliability. Now, if you're to layer and you work in financial technology, that is even truer, so to speak, of, for example, a random consumer app. You don't expect your payments to stop working. They should always be working. And if they don't, that can cause some serious disruption. So software has to be treated as mission critical as much as possible. And to be reliable, there's a lot of bells and whistles that you need to attach to your application. So metrics, tracing, logs, horizontal political scaling, alerts to know when something goes wrong, network policies to prevent escalations, liveness and adding probes uh, to that Kubernetes when to restart something, and so on and so forth. Like the list can get very long. And that is troublesome. Because in the end, and that's my personal, um, personal model, I would say, is convenience beats correctness. What this means is that if doing the right thing is in any way, shape, or form, more complicated than doing the wrong thing, then someone at a certain point in time will find a reason not to do the right thing. They have a deadline uh, next Monday and really need to ship this application. Or they think it's too complex and actually they don't need all that stuff. Like this is a small, small thing, it's gonna run in the cluster, it's not gonna get big. Then it gets big, then it fails, and then you have problems. So you won't be able to fall into the so-called peak of success they should naturally converge to doing the right thing because doing the right thing is the easiest thing to do. 
Now, I'm not going to cover uh, all the possible things that we require application to do, because that would be long and potentially quite boring. We're still going to focus on telemetry data. So think in topic we did talk, are we observable yet? What kind of telemetry data? So we said logs that we ship into Elasticsearch, metrics, which are scraped from Prometheus from our applications, and traces that we push into Jaeger for distributed tracing. So we're going to go one by one, uh, look at what they are, why they're useful, and how you collect them in a Rust application. So let's start from metrics. Why do you want to collect metrics? Well, generally speaking, you want to collect metrics because you want to be able to produce plots that look exactly like this. So you want to be able to see, well, what's the latency of this application in the last 30 minutes? and potentially break it down by percentile. So the 50th percentile, the 70th percentile, the 90th and the 99th, depending on the type of application, your performance profile. Or you might want to know what's the response breakdown. So how many 200s, how many 500s, how many 400s, and so on and so forth. Metrics, generally speaking, are there to give us an aggregate picture of the system state. So they're there to answer Boolean questions very often about how the system is doing. Is our error rate above or below 10%? Uh, is the error rate for requests uh, that come to this specific API on this endpoint above or below a certain threshold? Uh, are we breaking our SLAs on latency? And metrics are supposed to be as real time as possible. So they tell you what the system state is now in this very, very moment. What do metrics look like? So how do you actually get those plots that we just saw? Uh, metrics are generally looks somewhat like this. Um, so you have a metric name, which in this case is HTTP requests duration seconds bucket. So a bit of a mouthful, but it's very precise. So we're talking about the duration of HTTP requests, and we're looking at the histogram. Uh, so we're looking at buckets of requests at different type, at different thresholds of latencies. On this metric, we have a set of labels that we can use to slice uh, the metrics value. So we have endpoint, so what endpoint you're eating. Uh, the HTTP method, get, post, put, patch, whatever. The status code we returned, so in this case, 404. And then you have the bucket that we're looking at. So five milliseconds, 10 milliseconds, 25, and so on and so forth. And then the number of requests falling inside that bucket. Now, this was a super fast 404, so all 1,601 uh, fell beneath the five milliseconds. So generally, it's going to be a little bit more varied. Uh, this is basically a time series. Uh, a time series with a variety of values you can slice and dice from. These time series are produced by the application and then are aggregated uh, by Prometheus, at least in our specific setup. So Prometheus hits the slash metrics endpoint on all the copies of an application. Well, it could be on another endpoint, but that's generally the default. Aggregates all these metrics, indexes them, and then allows you to perform queries against them. One way to perform queries is to do alerts. So alert manager, you define a variety of queries which evaluate for Boolean. So as we said before, is the error rate, so the number of 500s, above or below 10% for 15 minutes? If yes, uh, then through PagerDuty, get an on-caller, so an on-call engineer, to look at the system because something is wrong. Uh, otherwise, you can use Grafana if you just want to do some pretty visualization. So if we go back to the slide we saw before, which is this one, this is Grafana. So we're looking just at Prometheus queries visualized. This is very, very useful for an on-call team or operation team uh, to actually understand what is going on. Now, how do you actually get metrics? So how do you get your API to produce metrics? Uh, the Redirect was developed using Aptix Web uh, for a variety of reasons. I wrote a piece about that uh, a couple of weeks ago, if people are curious. Uh, it's very, very easy. So there's a package on Crates.io called Actix Web Prom, so Actix Web Prometheus. Uh, you just plug the middleware inside your application, is that dot prop prom dot clone line. The middleware takes some very, very basic uh, configuration parameters, so a prefix for the metrics and the point you want to use, and then you set up. Like you're just going to expose slash metrics. Now, you might want to customize it. Uh, for your specific application, because you might need to collect metrics which are non standards. Uh, you might have specific naming conventions and so on and so forth. But Axis Web Prom is like a single file type of crate. 
So you can go there, use it as some kind of a blueprint, and adapt it to do whatever you need to do. So metrics, useful, very easy to collect. Uh, just plug and play if you're using graphics. Logging. As we saw, uh, metrics are about what is happening in the system, in the aggregate, at this very, very moment. So low latency, fairly aggregated type of data. Logs are instead useful to answer the question, what is happening to this specific request? Such as, what happened to users who tried to do a payment from, let's say, HSBC to Barclays uh, in the UK between 5 p.m. and 6 p.m. on the 27th of July? There's no way, unless I'm very lucky and the labels on the metrics are exactly the ones I need, but generally they aren't, because labels are supposed to be low cardinality on metrics. There's no way I can generally answer this type of question. Absolutely, I cannot answer it to this single request type of granularity, because those are all aggregated in metrics. Logs, instead, can provide us to that level of drill down that can allow us to slice and dice to get that precise level of information. That is key to actually debug what is going on in a distributed system, especially when things go wrong in a way which you haven't actually accounted for, the so-called unknown unknowns or emergent behavior in distributed systems. So let's look at what it looks like to log in Rust. So classic approach, uh, Rust 1.0 approach to logging is you use the log crate. The log crate is built using a facade pattern. So the log crate provides you a set of macros, debug, trace, info, warn, and error uh, to actually instrument your application. This is an example taken straight from the log crate documentation, or at least I think it was. Uh, you enter into the shape, the yak function takes a yak in a mutable reference for yak. You meet a trace level statement. So you announce to the world, we are commencing the yak shaving. It's trace level. So it's at a very verbose logging level. Uh, in most cases, it's going to be filtered out. Then you loop and try to acquire a razor. If you get a razor, info level, log statement, razor located, display implementation of the razor. You shape the yak and you break from the loop. And then you exit the function. If instead you fail to find the razor, uh, then you emit a warning saying, I was unable to locate the razor. And you're going to retry. Now, facade means uh, that you have no idea what is actually going to consume these log statements. You just instrument your code, and then generally, at the entry point of your binary, you are going to introduce a logger implementation. So an actual implementation that takes this log data and then does something with them, where something is generally shipping them some places. If you use the simplest possible logger, uh, which is generally a logger, you're going to see something like this. So you log into the console, standard out. In this specific execution, which I made, you get unable to locate the razor for three times. So we're looping three times. And then you actually locate the razor. So you have the log message, uh, the uh, name of the function, and then you have a timestamp and the log level. Now, this may work if you're doing common line applications. Uh, so if it's a single um, main function running and you have a user looking at logs to understand what is going on. In a backend system, uh, especially in a distributed backend system, uh, you have applications running on multiple machines. These applications are generally some kind of server, either a web server or a queue consumer or something like that. And they're executing many, many requests concurrently. And you want to be able, at a certain point, generally later, so you're not really there, in the logs to say what happened to request XYZ, which was about this type of users, as we discussed before. And the only way you can do that in plain logging is using text search. But text search is not easy to search. First of all, it's expensive. It cannot be indexed and requires also a lot of knowledge about how the logs are structured. So you end up, if you want to do anything that is non-trivial, so anything which is not tell me if this substring is in the log, you end up writing regexes. And writing regexes means that you are coupled to the implementation of the logging inside the application, which makes it very, very complicated uh, for operators and support people to actually go and use these logs. So all the pressure of operating the software ends up on the shoulders of the developers, which we want them to be there, but we don't want them to be the only ones who can answer questions about the system. So a much better way 
is to have structure logs. Structure logs in the sense that to each log line, we associate a context. And that context needs to be searchable, which in a very informal terms means that the context is in some machine readable format that somebody can parse and index, allowing people to filter on it and perform queries. So let's have a look at how we could do structure logging. So similar example, not fully identical. This time, the debug macro is coming from this log crate. It's log standing for structure logging. It's log crate, uh, this one as well, very established, uh, been there for quite some time. It allows you to um, specify the log message, so very similarly to what we were doing before. And then allows you to specify using the O macro uh, some key value pairs to be attached to your logs. Now, log has been, for a very long time, the only way to do structured logging in Rust. Uh, recently, if I'm not mistaken, the log crate has added a feature to add key value, um, key value pairs to log statements. But once again, as far as I've seen, at least after a month ago, almost none of the logger implementations actually supported key value pair logging. So you're once again down to slog uh, for doing structured logging. So what are we trying to do here? What we're trying to do here is what we generally want to do in distributed applications. So I want to know when something is beginning, I want to do some stuff, which might be composed of some subroutines, so this subunit of work function, uh, that might emit their own logs, so this event log, so who. And then you want to know when that thing has ended. And then given that we're shaving the yak on behalf of somebody else, so we're taking this user ID, I want the user ID to be associated to every log line and I also want to capture how long the whole application took. So I want to capture that elapsed milliseconds at the bottom. If once again, we plug into it uh, the most basic type of formatter, so in this case, it's a Boolean formatter logging to standard out, we get exactly this. So you see all the log statements, you see all the Boolean metadata, and everything is a JSON. Uh, so that means that I can parse this as JSONs, and I can filter in user ID very, very fast, very, very easily. Or I can push all these things somewhere else, which is going to index them and search them. And we're going to see that in a few seconds. Now, let's go back to the code. You may agree with me that this is very verbose. Uh, it's very, very noisy. Like, you have a lot of log statements which are interleaved with the application code. And you don't even see the application code here, but this function is already, already looking a little bit hairy. And this is because, generally speaking, uh, for most use cases, at least the ones the one I encounter in the wild, having orphan log events is generally the wrong abstraction. You reason about tasks. And tasks have a start time, they do something, and then they end. So what you really want to use is your primary building block uh, when you're doing some kind of instrumentation for structure logging is a span. And a span represents exactly a unit of work done in the system. So let's look at the same function using spans. We are moving away from slog, so we're leaving slog behind for the time being, and we're moving on to the tracing crate. Tracing crate is part of the Tokyo project, and I think it's not an overstatement. It's one of the most impactful crate, at least on what they do on a daily basis, which has been released in the past year or so provides extremely high quality implementation, and we're going to see it suits our needs perfectly. So a span. We enter into the function, and we create a span. The bug level, so we set uh, the level as if we were doing logging. We tell what's the name of the span, yak shave, and we associate with the span the user ID. Now, uh, the tracing crate uses a guard pattern. So when you, pre when, when you press, when you call the dot .enter function, uh, then you're going to enter inside the span. Everything that happens between the enter function method invocation and the dropping point of the underscore enter guard is going to happen in the context of the same span, which means there's no need for us to add, once again, the user ID to the bug. There's also no need for us to do anything weird about subunit work. Subunit work can ignore the fact that it's part of the yakshave function I can just go on to do its thing. And they will be able to emit log statements. And if that was log statements attach context, then we can also capture the context from the parent function. And all of these efforts happens pretty much transparently. Uh, what this means is that if we really want to shrink it, 
So if we really want to go to the essential of it, we can also remove those two lines of boilerplate so that span equal and then the enter function just use the tracing instrument proc macro, which is going to basically the sugar exactly to the same thing and leaves us with this function. Now, what's that? That's like one, two, three, four, five lines, uh, considering there's a closing bracket, so four or five, depending on how you count it. If you go and compare that to our slog version of this, you can clearly see how the agnostic implementation is now much less intrusive. It's, as we were saying before, much more convenient. It's much easier for developers to slap slash uh, um, ash tracing instrument on top of a function, and so allow them to build very, very domain-oriented uh, trace spans and do that consistently if that does not involve writing a lot of code, it does not involve polluting their function code, and is generally transparent uh, to the application. Now, tracing, just like log and just like slog, is a facade pattern. So what you do, you instrument your application using those macros, and then you have subscribers. Subscribers are the ones that actually receive this tracing data and can do something with it. So tracing can be used for structure logging. I think at this point in time, it's the best trait if you really want to do structure logging. So you can log all those spans to standard out or to a file or whatever you think it's useful to you. At the same time, using spans, and spans are exactly the concept used by distributed tracing, as we'll see in a second. So one type of instrumentation, tracing, and you're able to get, at the same time, writing no extra code, both structured logging and distributed tracing. And this is extremely powerful and also extremely consistent because you're going to get the same spans across the two uh, type of telemetry data. So telemetry data, how do we actually process logs? How do we actually process traces? So logs, uh, we take tracing, then we have a subscriber, the prints logs uh, to standard out in Boolean format is the tracing Boolean log for matter, which I wrote for Donate Direct and it's on Crates.io if you want to use it. Uh, then standard out is tailed by vector. Uh, vector is another Rust log corrector uh, that we use to get logs from standard out to AWS Kinesis, which is then going into Elasticsearch, which we then search using Kibana. So there's a bunch of hops. But in the end, you end up in Kibana. And Kibana is fairly good to search logs. And you don't need to be a developer to search logs in Kibana. So you go there, you have all the possible fields of your logs on the left, and you can filter uh, either existence, non-existence, on the specific value, doing regexes if you really need to. You can build views and graphs. And in general, it's very, very friendly. Uh, and we use Kibana at all levels inside the company. So from the application developers to the product managers, to the support engineers, to the first level of support, to customer success managers. That's what allows us to own, in a distributed fashion, uh, the operation of a product. Distributed tracing is more or less the same thing, just from a different perspective. So when you talk about logs, it's generally about a single application. So you have this application that is there, and it's doing stuff, and it's emitting logs. Now, in a microservice architecture, as the one we have here at Layer and in many places at this point, to serve a single request, uh, which is hitting the edge of your cluster, that request generally flows through one, two, three, four, five, six different microservices, which cooperate to fulfill the job. Now, when a customer comes to you saying, I tried to do X and it didn't work, you need to understand where exactly the problem is. So you need to be able to trace that request across the different microservices, and it should be easy to do so. The way you do this, or one of the possible ways, is by adhering to the um, Jaeger tracing format, which is now being evolved by the open tracing tracing format, which is now being merged into the open telemetry format. So on the uh, tracing crate, you have a tracing open telemetry subscriber, which is maintained in the same repository. You can use that, and we do, to ship logs into Jaeger, to ship traces into Jaeger. Jaeger is once again backed by Elasticsearch, so it's more or less the same infrastructure, and allows you to have this kind of view. So each of the units of work up here as a bar, you track how long each of those take, and you can see all the different services uh, that a single request coming from the outside flows through. That is very, very powerful to understand when something went wrong. So you're able to correlate a request 
across everything that is happening inside the cluster. So one final recap. As we said, production environments are extremely complex. And if you don't have any way to observe what is happening, and that generally means that in some kind of telemetry data, then your production environment is a ticking bomb. It might be alive today, but it's going to go off at a certain point in the future, and you're not going to like it. In order to know what is going on, you need to add diagnostic instrumentation. But for that to be there consistently, it is to be easy to add that instrumentation. And make it easy and convenient is your number one priority as an operator in general, as an architect of a platform. Now, different type of telemetry data gives us different type of information. So metrics are great to alert and monitor system state, while logs, uh, especially structure logging with high cardinality context is amazing to try to detect and triage uh, failure modes that you might not have prevented when you designed the system. To get very high quality structure logs, Spun is generally the type of abstraction that you want to use. And no matter how good your logging is at a single service level, you need to be able to trace a request across the different services. Either you do that with disability tracing or just a correlation ID that flows through, you need to have that somewhere. And overall, I guess the lesson learned is we were able to get a Rust application in production in less than a couple of weeks with top-notch observability and telemetry data. And that generally means that the answer to the talk, which generally is, if you're doing a talk with a question as a title, the answer is no. Like Steve, <laughs> the first day, the answer in this case is yes. So are we observable yet? Absolutely. Like tracing has been a step, step change improvement into the quality of the Rust log ecosystem when it comes to telemetry. And you can definitely ship high quality applications with very, very granular telemetry data. Now, the Net Direct was an experiment in using Rust in a live production application, and we liked it. So in one way or another, uh, probably the CTO was not fully sober when he said that, but we chose to bet on Rust uh, to do some new core projects, in particular writing a core banking application, which in a nutshell means uh, creating accounts programmatically, moving money in and out uh, programmatically once again. We're assembling a team. We hired already a bunch. We're still looking for one Rust backend engineer. So if whatever we covered here sounds interesting to you, just reach out. That's the opening there. That's my Twitter handle. Like there are many ways uh, to get in touch. And with that, I think this is the end of the talk. And I'd be more than happy to take some questions. Okay, we have one. So let's waffle from Twitch. He's asking, does this telemetry setup integrate well with distributed non-Rust applications? Uh, well, it depends on how we, uh, what do we mean by integrating well. Uh, in our specific use case, uh, we do have some structures that we expect application to follow in the type of telemetry data that they produce. So for, expect, for example, we expect metrics exposed by APIs to have a certain format or a certain naming convention. Uh, we expect our logs to follow the canonical log pattern. So generally I meet one log line with a lot of high cardinality data that we then use to do a variety of things. So generally speaking, there needs to be a little bit of coordination because of course, if somebody goes with the .NET Core uh, default format and I go with the Rust default format and you go with the Python default format, it's very unlikely that they're going to really match up really nicely. But you can use architectural dec decision records to just say, these are we do logs and then everybody implements in such a way that they can interoperate. So it needs a little bit of coordination. Mm 
Okay. So another one from Twitch, but Chris is asking, the trace crate looks very powerful. Are there any features that you wish it had? They don't have to be easy features. I'd just like to hear your thoughts on the design space more. Well, yeah, the tracing crate is extremely powerful. Uh, I did raise some issues for some of the things that uh, kind of surprised me. Uh, so those, some of those have made their way into the tracing crate itself. Uh, also bug fix on a core dump. That was nasty. Uh, but generally speaking, it's been amazing. Uh, things that I wish would be different. So at the moment, the tracing crate has a lot of focus on making telemetry uh, fast, or in general, reducing the overhead of doing certain types of operations. Uh, for example, one thing is um, traces. So the, data, the metadata you collect about the span is statically determined at the moment of span creation. And that is great, uh, because then everything is uh, much faster and consumes less memory. But sometimes, for the way certain applications are architected, uh, you would like to be able to add additional metadata dynamically, even if that means allocating or doing stuff that might not be what you want to do in an off loop, but maybe for that application and its performance profile uh, works fairly well. Another thing that we found uh, was a little bit of a slippery slope was the instrument macro which is very, very convenient uh, because it captures the name of the function, but it captures by default all the arguments of the function. And that can somewhat be tricky if you're managing secrets. Uh, so if you're managing things that you don't want to log. And so it's very easy to write a function today, uh, put the instrument macro up there, and somebody else comes two weeks from now, uh, adds another argument, which is a JWT token, and then a JWT token ends up in Kibana. Um, so it would be nice to have the possibility or different macros or whatever to have a uh, denial approach so that I need to explicitly allow certain fields to be logged, which for the type of application that we do uh, would make us sleep better. But generally speaking, I think it's great. And I think it's going to get more and more useful as different subscribers implementation uh, come into play. So not much to say there. OK, there's another question coming from YouTube. So Jeff Barzeski, I hope I pronounced that even remotely correctly. How do you configure tracing to send its data to the various backends? Are there docs? That is also support cloud distributed tracing backends, like AWS X-Ray. So uh, there are docs, absolutely. Uh, so if you go on the tracing subscriber uh, crate, there are very detailed docs on how to add different subscribers to the tracing pipeline. At the moment, of course, uh, there are some type of tracing subscribers implemented, but I doubt there are tracing subscribers for all the possible things. Uh, if in specifically you want to ship tracing data to X-Ray, I think the work that has been done in Open Telemetry for Rust means that you probably have an implementation of the standard. Uh, you might have to drive your own subscriber. Uh, probably using Resolve, that should be not too complicated to actually ship it to X-Ray. I haven't used it personally, so I don't know if it's out there already. OK. Uh, once again, from Solace Waffle, do you have an approach to avoid handling fields that contain personal identifiable information in telemetry data? Well, the approach at this point is trying not to put them there, uh, which, uh, as I said before, so responding to the other question can sometimes be tricky uh, because of the way instrument works. 
Um, so generally, we do have a detection system here at layer. So what we do is we continuously scan the logs uh, with semantic parsers that look for certain types of secrets that we know might possibly end up in logs, like GWT tokens, uh, AWS credentials, and other types of secrets that we don't really want people to, to have. But at the application level, a part switching instrument for being uh, allow all to be in denial, we don't have necessarily any specific approach. Okay, there's another question, once again on YouTube, uh, from Jeff. General Rust question, what is your preferred strategy for dealing with error handling? Okay, interesting. Um, in most of the applications we're writing at the moment, uh, we use a combination of this error and anyhow. So we use this error for all the places but we need to handle errors. So it's very nice to get uh, structured enums and you can match on and then do different things depending on the variant. And then when we just want to report errors, so we just want to have something that we log or we return to people as a response, then we use anyhow. And we generally use them in conjunction. So you might have uh, an error enum, which is using this error to get the error implementation. And then the different variants are actually wrapping an anyhow error. And what we're starting to do recently, once again, leverage the tracing crate is using tracing error. Uh, so capturing span traces uh, in our uh, errors. So that when we get logs, uh, they're actually very detailed about what happened. And that allows us to debug faster. Okay, I guess that means it's all for today in terms of questions. I've been asked by the friends of Rusty Day's uh, Pika Winner uh, for a Manning book promo code, I assume. Uh, in terms of best questions, that's going to be Soulless Waffle from Twitch. So I think you need to stay online for them to reach out to you. It seems there's one more question, though. Once again, by you, so that doesn't change the winner anyway. What was your thought process for deciding to build this project in Rust? Were there any attributes that made this project a good fit for the first production Rust application at your company? Oh, in terms of the application itself, uh, nothing specifically. Like We're talking of basically a client of an API that we suppose publicly is going to power a UI. Um, so it's not necessarily, doesn't need necessarily to be the fastest, uh, doesn't mean necessarily all the guarantees that Rust gives you. So we could have done that in any language. But we were looking to use Rust for other types of projects, uh, so for mission-critical projects, uh, in particular to leverage Rust's uh, very strong type system as combined with its very predictable performance profile. Uh, but it's somewhat of a big leap to adopt a new language uh, when writing a new mission critical project, only to find out when you actually release it uh, that you might have wasted a lot of time. So this was a very nice incremental step to de-risk the technology. So for example, look at all the observability situations, say, is this actually ready for what we need to do? And look at all the things that we need in an API, and can we actually write APIs with this? And so on and so forth. 
So it was very much uh, the risk operation. And as we de-risked all of these aspects, then it became possible for us to say, okay, now we can confidently bet on it for this other new product that we want to do. And there's a huge project and that fits Rust's profile for a variety of reasons. And now we know we're not risking too much. We're still taking some risk, uh, but it's not as big of a risk of passing from a small CLI to mission critical product uh, as they do. Okay, it's goodbye time. So thanks a lot for tuning in for the rest of the days and stay for the next talk from Dick McManara on Unsafe Good. Have a good evening. Bye bye.